I want to say um, it's kind of appropriate that we have this event here in Las Vegas because within eGain, I'm one of a very few, very privileged set of people who actually get to play. We play very, very seriously, but we get to play around with what's new, not just in technology, because in technology, what we come up with enables new business models, new use cases, new customer engagements. And so it's really that exploration that defines what we're doing in what we're informally calling eGain Labs. This play, again, which we uh, like to call eGain Labs, has been working on a number of new developments that hopefully you will be able to take advantage of very, very shortly. There's a number of things that we've built into the backlog, and I'm going to talk about two things here today. One is eGain Mobile. This is along with uh, all the other channels, taking all of those channels and delivering them wherever you go. The second that I'm going to talk about is eGain Cobrowse. And eGain Cobrowse is familiar to some, maybe even most of you, because we've been shipping it and offering it in the enterprise business model for probably upwards of 13 or 14 years. Some of you may not know that. But what we've done with it, like I said, when we got to this play theme, is really going to introduce new things that we can introduce in really new ways. And I'll, I'll, I'm just, I'm gonna hit that very hard when I get to that co-browse piece, okay? So let me figure out how to work this thing. This is forward, sorry. I'm gonna have to figure out how to do this. Okay, there we go. So the first thing is eGame Mobile. Now, uh, let's quickly go to the next slide. And good. The derivation is this. eGain is in the business, what used to be called interaction channels, but now we think of not just interaction because interaction is just what happens at the event level. We're now referring to this as engagement, as you heard Ashu say, because engagement is not at the event level, it's at the relationship level. So when you're building relationships with your customers, you don't just want interaction. You want to know what they've done previously. You want to know what they're likely to do next. You, know, you want to know where they went. You want to know where they're going to switch and get up from their desktop and go, you know, and finally contact you when they're on the road with a different device. One of the ways I've referred to this before is, remember this thing called CRM, Customer Relationship Management? You know, Siebel was one of the very first to coin that term. Siebel did an excellent job of C and M. They could manage customer data like you wouldn't believe. Okay? I know because I was uh, seven years at Siebel Systems. And even when I was there, I said, we're not doing enough with R, the relationship piece. Because it's in the R that you actually get to build that trust, that strong relationship with customers. And what Siebel was doing was building these big, massive silos and warehouses of data. But it's within the enterprise. It wasn't actually engaged with the customer at that, at that point. It was more for the VP of sales. It was more for the agent, less with the actual real-time interactions. So what we're doing at eGain is fully 100% dedicated to the R in CRM. And that's where I think you know, it really affects the customer. The customer doesn't care whether you've got 17 gigabytes of data on them. They want to know how they're going to be supported when they have an issue. Right? So that's the R. That's where we have to take engagement and take it not just when they're at the desktop or when the agent is at the desktop, but take it to wherever the agent is. So let's go to the next step in this slide. We have, and this is a little bit corny, but I'll do it this way, OK? One of the very first real-time interaction channels is, of course, telephony, which has been around over 100 years. Let's go to the next point. With web adoption, which came around the early 90s, we now had HTTP, HTML, and just look at the explosion that that's created in the last 20 years, okay? Huge adoption, you know, explosively more uh, impactful um, just in 20 years than any other channel that's uh, ever been created before. Let's go to the next one. So that explosion, along with miniaturization, with cellular infrastructure, with everything else, now means every single one of you is carrying a smartphone. 
every single one of you probably uses that phone more than you use your desktop phone, your, your landline, whatever it's called, right? By the way, I don't even have a landline phone number anymore. Why, why check two, right? Just check one. So what this has created is that these tablets, which are miniaturized versions that are actually you know, more powerful than desktops were five, 10 years ago, can do way more now, as you each know, than desktops uh, that you used to be sitting at. And the way that capability gets delivered has changed as well. You know, initially, you saw companies come up with m.company.com. You know, they would create a new version of the web page that was specifically tailored for that 600 you know, pixel form factor or that 1024 pixel form factor. More and more, as you need integration with everything else that's in that platform, whether it's GPS, whether it's the other apps, you know, whether it's sensors, whether it's mics, you know, whether it's uh, orientation, the delivery of capability into these platforms is now via applications, these small little things called apps, which you can download for one or two dollars, or often it's free. And now you get a very rich experience in this new tablet form. So people are now very, very accustomed to going to a store and just really adding a bit of functionality to their tablet platform. You've each probably all done this. I would venture to get, say, 99% of you have all done this uh, <laughs> for Angry Birds, if for nothing else, okay? So the app is how um, capability now gets delivered into the, to the tablets. So given that this tablet format is what's going to be everywhere, and that's where you know, interactions are likely to happen, eGain saw a very natural to say, we have to be on that platform. We're gonna be in every tablet, okay? Eventually, we'll be in every phone. Um, we actually have the, all the software working on phones. We still believe that it's still a little bit small uh, for all of this capability to be really meaningful, but it does work, okay? So that's why we're focusing more on the tablet form than on the, the phone itself. And next uh, point here is that in the continuing arc of taking advantage of every single channel that's out there, you know, we will continue to look at every other new device and every other new platform that comes around. What's the next one you're likely to be interested in? Anybody looking at glass? Probably. We're now signing up uh, with Google to become a glass developer, so hopefully, maybe not next year, but ho hopefully soon, we'll be able to show you what's going on there as well. But I'm here to talk about tablets today. Let's go to the next uh, point. So what we're here to talk about is eGame Mobile, which is a way to deliver self-service, Virtual assistant, eGain offers management, click to call voice channel, chat, and co-browse. Eventually, it'll incorporate even more, but these are what are available today. So in this particular form factor, <clears throat> we deliver all of these channels which you already have familiarity with into this device, which is now on your person, on your customer's physical presence probably 99% of the time they're awake. So, before I spend too much time, you each know what each of these channels does. What we're delivering is a way for you to take advantage of that yourself. So, we have put together a reference application around this, uh, this company called Purple Nile that we will show you. And this is a way to show you how each of these channels could be integrated so that you could take that very same set of use cases, that very same set of deployment uh, considerations and deliver it as part of your business, okay? So with that, let's go to a video. It's a very short video, less than two minutes. Let's see what the eGay Mobile looks like and then I'll say a few more. When you have great deals and offers for your customers, you want them to know. But when your customers are on the go, what's the best way to engage them? Send them a message right on their phone. Show them your offer right in your app. Answer their questions as soon as they come up. How much is shipping for this item? Shipping for this item starts at $2.99. Can I use my free shipping coupon with this item? 
This question is better suited for a live agent. Allow me to connect you. Quickly connect customers to the correct channel for help as soon as they need it. Hello? Hello, Miss Smith. I'm calling from Purple Now Support. How can I help you today? I'd like to use my free shipping coupon with a sale item. Can I do that? Of course. I see that you're shopping through your phone app. Let me connect via Cobrow so I can show you where to enter your coupon code. Sure. Guide your customers to the right place with Cobrows. How do you create better multi-channel customer engagement on mobile devices? Power your app with eGain. What do you think? <clears throat> I'll tell you, it's a real privilege to work at eGain Labs. This is fun stuff. OK, so. This is just a quick view at what eGame Mobile uh, can do. Um, if you see that any of those use cases, that scenarios applies to you, come down to one of our demo stations and you know, really ask the, uh, the people there all the questions that pertain to your business. Okay? You can download this little reference app today. So go to the iTunes uh, store uh, where you get your Angry Birds app and bring it down. Uh, we, have, sorry, um, we have submitted it there. And uh, it'll be just a matter of time before Apple approves uh, the process. Uh, but on the Android side in the Chrome Web Store, it's actually available today. So you can go there, immediately do it today, probably wait a small number of days or weeks uh, before we get it approved by Apple. Here's the other thing. If you're already building an Android application in your company, we have a software development kit. It's a set of libraries you know, with some uh, guidance on how to incorporate this. So talk to your account exec. Um, and we'll get you details about how to basically deliver this library to your developers so you can actually start playing around with, uh, with eGame Mobile, okay? So that's the very first thing I wanted to bring up uh, and talk about. Uh, do you wanna do questions on this one now or do you wanna do it uh, when we hit the end of the session? Okay, so let's just do it at the end of the session then, okay? Let's go to Cobrowse next. So Cobrowse, by the way, how many people, just so I can see, are familiar with eGain Cobrowse already? How many are not? Very few are not. Very good. That's probably very expected because we've actually been shipping Cobrowse for quite a while. We had a thing called, um, we just called it Cobrowse, and the value proposition that we were seeing, um, the, the upside, I'll tell you about the upside, is that it was really doing good things for customer engagement for uh, resolving issues and for closing issues on first attempt. The downside that we saw very early with a version one product was that it was expensive, time, uh, time consuming, expensive, brittle to deploy. So given that we saw that there was a value proposition there and there was user adoption and businesses uh, actually liked it, we tried to resolve the usability issues, the maintenance issues, the support issues, in the notion of simplicity and ease, which you've heard about. And that's what, in around 2009, compelled us to basically rewrite the entire product. So we have a second generation architecture that we're shipping as part of eGain v10. By the way, how many of you are uh, using eGain v10 Cobrows today? I'm just curious. I know at least a few of you are. Actually, some of you are um, in Europe, so some of those representatives may not be here at Las Vegas. But the, we continue to learn. So what we did between V1 and V2 was this. The original, if you were to say to anyone, how would you build a Cobra solution where two people anywhere on the internet could interact with a website and share exactly the same web session? The simple, let's say, first grader attempt at trying to build a Cobrowse is, here's the website, you put a server here, and up here you'd have the customer and the agent, they would both talk to this little server, and a server would talk to the dot-com website, right? Fairly natural, it's a common um, design pattern, but what we found out is that we were violating HTTP security, we were having rendering problems, we were having performance problems, we were having security problems, because our software was trying to pretend it was a website 
to both the agent and the customer. It was trying to pretend to be a user to the dot-com website, and it was taking session cookies and trying to pretend that you know, it applied to both sessions. Very complicated. That was one of the reasons why it was very expensive and brittle to deploy. So the key notion in uh, version two of Code Browse was to remove that particular architecture. You'll notice that in that architecture, when our server talks to the .com website, it affects everything that's going on with the session. We wanted to eliminate that, uh, that issue. So we just took it away. We said from the user to the website, we're not gonna get into the middle of that communication. We're gonna stand off to the side over here and from the customer to the agent, we're just gonna handle that communication independent of the website here. That's what we're calling the non-proxy or asymmetric architecture. And that's what we're shipping as part of uh, V10 and V11. And uh, what we did was from V10 to V11, we made another quantum step, I think, in improvement, which was, uh, some of you remember this Adobe technology called Flash. At one time, Flash was looking kind of promising. You know, it was promising client side, it had a full uh, VM. It was very uh, rich, it was very interactive. So we thought, hey, there's a, there's a model here. Let's, let's build this second generation thing on the client side using Flash. Well, we didn't anticipate that Steve Jobs and the rest of the internet would come down so hard on Flash and basically kill it within a very small number of months. So the key difference going from V10 to V11 of Cobrowse is that we removed Flash from the client side. So everything on the client side is now done via JavaScript, and indeed, we've taken uh, the HTML technologies involving CSS3, JavaScript, uh, some of the newer calls, some of the newer uh, browser advancements, like the uh, inner frame communications, and those mechanisms are what we've used to build the version three architecture of Cobra. Uh, sorry, let's go to the next slide so I can, uh, let's actually proceed beyond that. I've been talking without proceeding via the thing. This uh, point, which I also wanna backtrack a little bit to is, you know, many of you are familiar with other screen sharing, desktop sharing solutions. Why not use those? How many of you used WebEx or GoToMeeting? Right, a lot of people, it's very common, right? How many of you can actually start a meeting right on the dot at 000 using these technologies? I can't, right? Usually there's somebody on the meeting that says, oh, I gotta download it, or oh, my version of Java is not the latest version, it's not supported by this, and oh, by the way, you know, I need control, why don't you pass me control so I can show you my slides? Uh, oh, oh, by the way, so where's the chat window so I can actually chat, you know, I gotta find it, you know, in the separate toolbar. Heavy overhead, heavy setup overhead, heavy usage overhead, okay? So we didn't want that. We wanted a version where you didn't have any of those issues to worry about, okay? So, I mean, if you can even start within three minutes of the start of the meeting using one of these technologies, you've actually, you know, far mastered this beyond the 98% of the user base. Let's go to the next slide. And, yeah, there was a time where mail was the internet. Actually, most of you probably don't even know there are many dozens of protocols. Um, SMTP is mail, FTP is one, Telnet is another, you know, there are Gopher, Waze, V39.50. There's a lot to the internet above and beyond just the web. But when it comes to support models, mail used to be it. So we were finding that in the early years, especially when eGain was founded around 97, Email was still the paradigmatic interaction channel with customers. Chat has come on very, very strongly in the last five, six, seven years, and it's now probably the most active area where we see it, uh, action with customer engagement, call centers, uh, customer uh, um, relationship building. The other thing was, as I mentioned, the early attempts at doing Cobrowse were suffering from some of these very technology-driven uh, issues. And indeed, with some of the developments in HTML5, now we can use those new capabilities to do communications where before we had no other alternative than Flash, okay? 
So it is a matter of time. It took, a, took time for the internet standards bodies, the browser builders, to actually build in the mechanisms that we required in order to deliver a very quick, very seamless, zero overhead version of Cobra. And here's the other thing. Customers were trying to provide FAQs and self-service sites using their websites, using just ba basic HTML and server-side database lookups and search. It didn't allow the agent to get involved in those activities. So with Cobrows now, we can actually allow the customer and the agent to share exactly the difficulties that the customer is, is experiencing on the website. And the agent, instead of spending 67% or whatever the number is, I think it's close to 67% of the time saying, why don't you click that link that's to the left of the orange button and just you know, a little bit below the, the paragraph that describes the blah, blah, blah. If you can eliminate all of that and just let the agent point exactly to where the object is that's, that's uh, the next step for the customer, you save a lot of interaction. You focus on the problem at hand rather than trying to navigate your website. Next slide, please. So for all of those reasons, with V10, V11, and now what used to be called V12, but we're changing the nomenclature a little bit, we have, in the last two or three years, since we've been shipping this uh, latest version of Cobrows, already equaled and surpassed the number of customers that were developed, were, were um, able to adopt Cobrows V1 in 10 years. In 10 years of Cobrows V1, we got, you know, this many customers, and this, actually there's a few more that I haven't even itemized here, in a span of about two and a half years, already exceeds the adoption, and certainly by, by agent number standards, already exceeds the adoption of V1. So we're seeing a very nice adoption of Cobrows because the value proposition works. I'll give you two data points uh, now because um, one is one of our prospects, when they described to us why they were so interested in Cobrows, they did some internal studies of their own. And even before deployment of Cobrows, they were expecting greater than 100% um, customer satisfaction increase and resolution time, not resolution time increase, uh, uh, issue closure rate increase. In other words, whether the issue was handled on the first time or not, they're expecting not just 10, 15, 20, 30 percent improvement. They're expecting over 100 percent improvement. I will add to that a second data point by one of the customers here at this particular conference that actually measured this phenomenon. And at first, what they said, I found even difficult to believe. They're saying that their closure rate with voice assisted agent sessions was let's say X percent, okay? So X percent was how quickly, how, how you were able to resolve that issue on the first time the customer contacted you. They said that with Cobrows and voice together, three X. That blew me away. That said, this value proposition is not something you even want to put into a spreadsheet. It's just a no brainer, okay? So we're seeing that uh, these kinds of value propositions is exactly why eGain, ever since 2000, and all the way through rewrite of version two, rewrite of version three, and now extending even beyond that, has been so committed to this particular interaction engagement channel. It really is a no-brainer. You can talk about these use cases. Uh, for example, one of our customers here, their use case is simply to get their users registered, to get you know, their IDs and their email addresses. Even that alone was enough to justify the Cobrows deployment. So you can go from simple value propositions like that to complex ones where very large companies with you know, complex uh, solutions are deploying it across, let's say, over 400 different URLs and, and pages and just deploying it whole hog. We have uh, some of our newer customers now with a product catalog that's in the millions that are uh, in the process of deploying Cobrows and so it's still very early stage there, but uh, the early returns are actually very promising. Next slide, please. So how simple is it? Remember this theme of ease, simplicity? Well, 
as I mentioned before, the problem with V1 was it was expensive, it was difficult, it was you know, high overhead, all these sort of things. We wanted to remove that. So what I'm gonna talk about the next several minutes is a part of how you engage with the latest version that we've got. Now underneath, we're introducing uh, kind of a bifurcation of um, the deployment model. One is that we continue to deploy Cobrowse the way you all know it's deployed in V10 and V11, which is we add a very simple allow Cobrowse tag to your website footer. Okay, typically your footers uh, reused across all these pages. You put this tag in there one time. Now all of a sudden all your pages are Cobrowse enabled. Okay, so that's deployment model number one. Deployment model number two allows us to get involved with a whole segment of the internet that we're not previously able to get involved with. In other words, what it says is anybody, not just a very high capital enterprise, but anyone can now do Cobrowse. And the reason we did this is because we introduced this very, very, very small thing. It's just maybe that many lines of code, okay? Really, really that many lines of code. And we put it into something called a browser extension. So if you download and install this little browser extension, you, all by yourself, just with that two second action, can now co-browse any site on the web with anybody that you know. Well, actually, no, sorry. Anybody that has an email address, or a chat, or a Skype, or a Yahoo Messenger, or some ID. Anyway, you need to be able to get a little short link, about that long, okay? You need to get that link, either in email or chat, to them, they click this link, now you're co-browsing. How simple can it get? How simpler could it get, okay? We don't know a way to get it simpler, okay? So this is the process. If you go to this uh, site that we've set up, by the way, this site is now called beta.cobrowse.com. I know that we've been talking about cobrowse.com, but the, the actual activation of cobrowse.com is gonna take about 24, 48 hours for the uh, DNSs to propagate. So right now, go to beta.cobrowse.com. You're gonna see exactly this, okay? It's a very simple website. When you first get there, we either ask you to sign up, or we ask you to log in, or we ask you to join an existing Cobrowse session, okay? Very simple, that's it. Next slide, please. So if you wanna sign up, all you have to provide is three pieces of information, your email, a password, and make sure you just type the password in uh, correctly twice and agree to our terms of service. That's it. It's not egregious, very low overhead. Next slide. What happens next is, depending on what browser you're using, if you're using a, uh, a Chrome browser, it'll go to the Chrome web store, download it, very simple, you know, one or two click install process. Now your browser is enabled. Next slide. And now, you click this little icon that's now installed into your browser, and it will present this UI, the uh, UI that you're seeing in the top right here. This is what you as the host would see, okay? When you hit the invite button there, it will give you a very, very short URL and also offer to send this URL via email or via Twitter or via Facebook or it'll let you just copy and paste this into any other mechanism you want. Basically, you have a number of choices to deliver this short URL to your, your friend who you're trying to get to join this session, okay? Your friend, your guest, is gonna see the UI that's on the bottom here, okay? They have fewer options, okay? So what they're allowed to do is basically follow you, click, point, etc. Let me just step back a little bit. You know, the web is a very simple technology, okay? What can you do with a web browser? You can point at things, you can click on things, you can fill in forms. That's pretty much it, right? So when we're building a co-browse solution, we want that seamless web browsing experience to be available not just to the host, but to the guest as well. And we've done that, okay? So the guest on any web page that you're currently looking at together can click on links, can fill in forms, move their mouse, We've also added one or two other little refinements, okay? So we've added the ability for both participants on the Cobra session 
to know where the other's mouth is. Okay, so this is kind of like real time. You don't have to pass control back and forth. You both are able to see each other's mouth. By the way, see this at the demo station. Okay. The second thing is, if I, as a host, I'm going to go to Amazon or any other website and provide my purchase information or my address information or my social security number information or my credit card information, even though I like my friend, I may not want them to see it. Okay? So we built in a little rules engine so that these sensitive pieces of information are blocked from your guests. Okay? So you can rest assured you are not divulging any private or secure information to your guests, and they can still enjoy the full web experience with you, provide you assistance, guidance, you know, questions, review, whatever you want to do with them on the web together without compromising your personal information. Okay? The other thing is, because this is a web content solution, how many, by the way, when you use WebEx or GoToMeeting or any of these other uh, technologies, you know you're limited to the screen size and dimensions and resolution of your presenter, right? So if your presenter is using a 1024 by 768 screen, and I've spent the extra 50 bucks to get a 1920 by 1080 screen, I can only use this much of it, right? Doesn't make sense, it's ugly. So what we do is we don't send images. We don't send pixels back and forth like those other guys do, okay? We send HTML. We send the actual CSS and HTML. What does that mean? It means that the HTML and CSS actually render natively in the guest's browser so that they are then seeing the full screen size that they've paid that extra $50 for, or if they're on a smaller device, it again shows very nicely in that smaller device. It's not squeezing a lot of information into that smaller form factor. Very natural. Okay? It's the way it ought to work. Not only that, we don't care what browser you use as a guest. As long as it's on a relatively, relatively recent browser, whether it's IE or Safari or Firefox or Chrome, it'll work. Okay? By modern, I mean you know, at least trying to keep up with HTML5. Okay? That's all we ask. You can be on any screen geometry. You can be on any operating system. You can be in any browser subject to those requirements, and you're co-browsing. Next slide, please. So here's an example. Uh, one of our very recent uh, friends is Land's End. They have, um, I don't know if they're actually live yet, but I know they've been in uh, deployment now for several weeks. Uh, we anticipate that their volumes of usage are gonna be uh, among some of the higher volumes that uh, we've ever seen. So you can see, uh, here's a screenshot where somebody's taking one of our newer capabilities. You'll notice that in the upper right, there's this little button called Sketch. I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Somebody's actually sketched up this little lower left image and actually said, actually, I'm not sure it's very particularly useful, but you know, they've marked it up. You can tell that was not na natively part of the web page originally. Next slide. So. What Cobrowse is attempting to deliver, like I said, is the very basic web experience of pointing, form filling, clicking, et cetera. But now we're thinking, what would you like to do now that you've got a friend looking at the same web page with you? Okay? Some of you are old enough to remember this thing called paper. You used to be able to you know, take it, mark it up, and then hand it to somebody. Ever since content went to the web, you haven't really been able to do that, right? When's the last time you were able to read a web page, mark it up, and share it with somebody? I don't, I don't know when, okay? So we added this thing called Sketch. What Sketch is going to let you do is do exactly that. Mark up a web page and share it with somebody, okay? If you want to be a little bit more formal about things, we have this little thing called Note. And we bring up a little rectangle. You can type in whatever you want to. And since this is now actually real ASCII, do people still use the term ASCII? Anyway, since you actually are typing, it actually then appears as a really nice note, like this uh, note from Jessica, you know, what colors have you for this item? So you can sketch, you can note. And now, once you've marked up a web page, you don't want it to disappear, we allow you to save that actual web page, right? So you can save it and then share it with a simple URL 
to anyone else, not just the friend that you're co-browsing with, but any other third party. Suppose I wanted to invite two people to a co-browse session, but uh, one was not available at that particular time. I shared my session with person A. I saved that screenshot. I now share it with person B so that they now see what we were able to do in a co-browse session. Same thing with the entire session itself. Okay, so we have the notion of the entire session where we share all the URLs and all the snapshots that we've taken during that session, or we can save an individual snapshot itself. Okay? Next slide, please. So here's a little bit more detail on these capabilities. What happens with notes is you just click the note button. You basically try and click on whatever it is that you're trying to annotate. It could be a paragraph, an image, you know, a part of the column, you know, any part of the web page you want, and then you type your note, okay? Because this little anchor point, this little uh, point, you know, at the bottom there, is now pointing exactly to where you clicked on the page. Type your note, click post, you're done. Okay. So not only is it useful in a real-time interactive mode, so the person could actually say what it is, this precise point that you're commenting on, but now if you save this to a snapshot, any other person that has that saved snap can see exactly what you're talking about. Next slide, please. This is an example where we've marked up, by the way, you can certainly see from this that we are not putting allow crow browse tag on this particular website, right? There's no way we have that capability. The only way we do this is via this latest uh, technology we have delivered in this browser extension, okay? Next. Now this thing called Sketch. Same thing, very easy, very identical user experience. You click the sketch button, you click somewhere on the page where you want to be annotating, and then you just start moving your mouse and you have the choice of colors, brushes, pens, uh, brush types, etc. And then you can just uh, have at it. Next slide. So here's one example, okay? This is an example where using notes and sketch together Let's say, this by the way, was a demo that we did for an insurance company for filing a, uh, an accident claim. So instead of talking and saying, well, I was at this corner and somebody was coming this direction and I was traveling that direction, no, not that direction, that direction, uh, and we hit so-and-so right there and there was a tree there, blah, blah, blah. We can actually go to maps or any other site and just draw it up. So red is where the other car was going, blue is where I was going, and then I can actually attach notes to specific locations, not just HTML content locations, but map locations, as you can see. And then this thing saved becomes part of your claim record, okay? So that's just one use case. Imagine doing this with every website, you know, whether it's planning travel, whether it's buying an airline ticket, whether it's, you know, helping somebody with homework, you know, this, I could go on and on and on, right? whether it's looking for real estate, you know. All of these can be assisted by getting other people to help you, right? We're finding that these cases where either there's a large dollar amount involved where the instantaneous decision is probably not the most appropriate one, but you really want to get somebody else's feedback on this, that's where you really want to share that co-brow session, right? You don't want to just send URLs and say, hey, look at that. You know, sometimes you do when the other person's not available, but if they are, why not just look at the site in real time with them? The other is when we actually have a multiplicity of opinions. Let's say I'm planning some travel to uh, Vietnam or some vacation site, and you know, some people want to go sightseeing, some people want to go restaurant hunting, some people want to go see the beach, etc. Just being able to just share the itinerary and be able to plan all that together and go on various different feature sites, we're finding that's another one of our nice uh, use cases in the deployment scenario. Next slide, please. So once you've saved a session or a snapshot, you go to your home, your My Sessions page, and we see that these are the sessions and snapshots that we've, that we've got. You know, there's icons on each of these that allow you to share, delete, you know, uh, these snaps and sessions. So it's very easy. Once you click it, put in the, U, um, the email address where you want to save it to, boom. The other person gets an email with a very small link, they click it, now they're looking at your saved snapshot or your entire session. Next slide. So, in summary, 
We've been busy. Sorry, and we've been busy. We've put multi-site code browsing. Okay, I didn't actually uh, feature this very much. What happens when you actually remove the ability to put, sorry, remove the requirement to put this allow code browse tag on the footer of every page? Well, now every site is just like every other site, right? Our application is now enabled by this browser extension. It doesn't require anything on the .com website. So I can go to any site. I can go to eBay, I can go to Amazon, I can go to USAA.com, I can go to landsend.com, I can go to Avon. Boom, same session. My guest travels with me. Notes, the ability to mark it up. Sketching, do a freehand drawing. Oh, one thing I didn't even talk about, really cool capability. We can take a PDF document or a PowerPoint document, convert it in real time to a page image, and now you're co-browsing that, okay? You don't have to get into presentation mode. I mean, it, it's a kind of poor man's presentation mode. It's not gonna do all your animations and you know, music, et cetera. But if all you need is the presentation itself and be able to point to a thing and be able to draw on it, this is perfectly uh, acceptable. So many people were asking that, so now we have that. Saving snapshots, saving share sessions, and the UI, the whole point about ease, about user experience. This has really driven a lot of the innovation around CoBrowse since uh, we started doing all the rewrites in 2009. We've really, really been focused on what is the easiest way for the user, both the host and the guest, to start and engage in a CoBrowse session. That's really driven all the innovation, really it has, okay? Then another use case is on the part of the deployment team. Okay? We wanna make it simple for them as well. So we were actually um, adopting the cloud deployment model for CoBrowse since day one, ever since we decided to uh, redo this CoBrowse implementation starting in 2009. Next slide, please. Let's go to the next slide. So what happens in Vegas should not just stay in Vegas. Okay? This is one example where this is an uh, exception. You can actually do this. Okay? You can go to beta.cobrowse.com, download it. It takes all of maybe three seconds to do, okay? It's really that easy, okay? If you can type your email, if you can actually come up with a password, you're enabled, okay? Firefox is probably the best first browser to try, okay? Um, we're not unwilling to do it for, uh, let's say, Internet Explorer, et cetera. But the decisions that Microsoft has made, just parenthetically, with how they want developers to work with their browser has made it even more difficult to provide this kind of extension to their platform, okay? So yeah, it's possible. Yeah, we'll probably sooner or later get around to it. It's gonna be a very high cost. And right now, while we're pushing the envelope of innovation as quickly as we can, we're right now confining ourselves to Firefox and Chrome, which are the platforms that are really at the forefront of really enabling this whole application uh, ecosystem that we're taking advantage of, okay? Not only this, go to the uh, demo station and check it out. Actually, you know, provide your website, get onto your own laptop or your own tablet and see how it works, okay? And then lastly, give us feedback, okay? Everything that we've done in this product since 2009 has been with a lot of customer feedback, okay? I wanna give particular thanks to the USAA team here. They were our very first co-development partner for CoBrowse, and it was due to them and their continued involvement in this particular project that allowed us to really do a lot of this innovation that my team's actually been privileged to do. So the more feedback we get from you about what do you need for your use case or your scenario or your user base or your constituency or your particular IT uh, restraints, let us know, because then we'll have that information with as much lead time as possible to build it into our roadmap. How am I doing on time? Because I think I'm uh, just about done with the slides. That's the call to action, okay? Let me just make one last reference. Two points. One, as new channels get created or discovered or built, eGain, and in particular eGain Labs, is gonna be one of the first people out there trying to figure out what can we do with it to make your business more effective, to deliver a better user experience to your customers, and to be able to make that engagement as rich as possible to increase customer satisfaction, 
close rates, business objectives, et cetera. What else did I want to say? Oh, I had a second note for it. Oh, the roadmap, as I said. What we're talking about here in uh, eGame Mobile and CoBrowse is two of N, where N is in the probably five at least, projects that we have ongoing. So not only are we asking for innovation around CoBrowse and mobile, but get into a conversation with us about new channel because we're, we're probably working on it. We're working to get more close interaction with voice channel, with more forms of document sharing, with non-CoBrowse enabled page markup. There's a number of things that are exciting, but we only had time to talk about two of these things today. Some of the other ones will come probably next year or the year after that, okay? So again, what happens in Vegas should not just stay in Vegas. Try this at home, install it, try it, tell us about it, okay? Thank you very much. So these, um, what that means is that the tablet format right now is not the host, okay? We're allowing the tablet right now to be the guest. But right now, uh, it is a little bit more difficult to install. Let me tell you why. The browsers on both iOS and on the uh, Android tablet form don't make it uh, possible to do install extensions the way the desktop browsers do, okay? So even though as a guest, all of this stuff works, if you can get past that very first step of installing the extension, which we could actually help you with in that particular case, okay? There's a way, there's a 20 step way in which you can get that done, okay? So that's why we're not featuring it right now. We're just focusing on start first on the desktop as the host, and then your guests can actually use a tablet, okay? Good question, sorry. And other questions? Yeah, um, what if we want to co-browse the guests session? So more in a service mode, I want to see what you're doing as my guest in online banking. Mm -hmm. Could I take you to our login page and you can log in with your credentials so I okay. can see it? Two ways to answer that question. Number one, if you deploy the enterprise solution that we're shipping right now with V11, that is the natural way that we actually work. So in other words, we offer co-browse in a, let's say, click to call or click to co-browse or click to chat model. And if the customer initiates that, then the agent joins the customer session. Okay, so it's the customer that's got the session with the .com website, and the agent is now looking over the shoulder of the customer. That's the natural deployment model with V11, okay? It turns out, um, do we have anybody from Highmark here today? We probably do, okay? Good, excellent, thank you very much. With this particular uh, engagement, which was um, instigated by the uh, recent healthcare plan that was, uh, what, three years ago, passed as legislation, we now have a demographic, and correct me if I'm presenting this incorrectly, but we're trying to reach a demographic now that maybe previously um, was not enabled with um, the ability to, sorry, let me, let me rephrase this. Uh, they needed more guidance, okay? So the agent, in this case, had to initiate the session, and then the customer would join that particular session and then the customer would then identify themselves, authenticate, log in, et cetera. So in this case, it's exactly as you say. Uh, it is a agent-initiated session, but where the customer is now owning that session from a uh, account perspective, okay? So we have to reverse the way the rules engine worked, okay? Initially, uh, the rules agent was protecting the host's data from the guest. In this particular case, we had to add the ability for us to protect the guest's data from the host. So we are now handling both those cases, okay? We can talk in more detail about this, and I'm sorry if I've uh, mangled that particular use case, but that's uh, roughly what we've done, okay? Any other questions? Let's uh, do the mic thing here. The, the co-browse, is it for the guest, is it just for this new version where it's Chrome and Firefox, or do like V11, it works for any browser? Like, does it work so, for IE browsers? Yeah. Uh, V11 is based on the allow co-browse tag in the footer, okay, as the integrated product. So it is available to any um, browser that's documented in the eGain deployment guide, okay? So it's not the same restriction. Okay. The restriction comes just for the extension itself. And that's why the extension architectures in Firefox and Chrome are more advanced and more open than, let's say, uh, IE. 
that's that's why we've come up with that particular restriction. Okay. Yes. On uh, eGain email, is there a reason why you made um, attachments more cumbersome than like Microsoft Outlook, where they're visible and clickable, right with the email? I don't think that was an intentional decision. <laughs> but uh, if we wanted to talk about email, let's talk about email separately, okay? Uh, I wanted to see if we could actually focus more on mobile and co-browse today. Is that okay? Okay. So let's talk about that offline then, okay? Any other questions? One more. Again, please go to the demonstration. Try this at home. Oh, one more question. Just a real quick question around use case scenarios with the cobrowse.com website. I plan on showing this to a lot of customers to you know, get their feet wet in the technology. Mm -hmm. Are there any use case restrictions that I should tell them about, you know, just use it as a trial purpose or, you know, that's, you know, yeah. what's the... Yeah, it is a beta version. And uh, as beta versions go, uh, typically we don't promise that whatever you do in cobrowse in the beta phase will actually be kept as we go live. On the other hand, we just have to do that for legal reasons. We'll make every attempt possible to try and retain that information, in particular your saved snaps and your saved sessions. It's just that we're not guaranteeing it, okay? The, the other case is that uh, right now, we're using this uh, location called beta.cobrowse.com. Eventually, when we go live and we feel that it's stable enough, we will change that to go to just cobrowse.com, okay? But it's not there today, okay? Yeah, believe it or not, as a beta, it is a free service. You don't have to pay nothing, okay? We don't even collect any credit card information. <laughs> we don't even have to prove that you're over 13, okay? okay? Any other questions? Thank you very much. Ooh.